Welcome members and guests to the March 27th program of the City Club of Eugene, Perspectives on the Future of Forest Management. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Marlene Nessery, City Club President. Our sponsors today are Network Charter School, a standards-based, hands-on public school for students in grades 7 to 12. Essex General Construction, we develop partnerships as strong and sturdy as the buildings we construct, and KRVM Radio. Special thanks go to KPFF Consulting Engineers for supplying our office space and to KLCC Radio for airing these programs at 6.30 on Monday nights and for archiving the podcasts on their site as well. A quick reminder that we host nearly 50 original nonpartisan issue programs every year. If you believe with us that civic engagement is the lifeblood of democracy, please do join us. We welcome donors, sponsors, members, volunteers, and students, anyone who has a stake in community life. Also, we're kicking off elections season this spring, so if you or someone you know would be a good candidate for the City Club of Eugene's 12-member board of directors, please let us know. Our annual meeting will be May 15, 2015. Today's program, Perspectives on the Future of Forest Management, is coordinated by Lisa Arkin, who will introduce our speakers. Thank you, Marlene. We have three speakers today. The first one is Greg Wagenblast, who is with the Oregon Department of Forestry's South Cascades District. The South Cascade District, based in Springfield, covers 1.13 million acres and runs along the mountains and foothills in eastern Lane County and Lynn Counties. As district forester, he oversees activities on private forests, from large industrial holdings to family woodlands. <clears throat> Our second speaker is Matt Fehrenbacher, who has been managing private forest lands in Western Oregon for over 20 years. Matt earned his degree in forest management at Oregon State University and is currently developing and managing several carbon projects in forests in the Western and Southeastern United States. And third, we welcome Mac Mark Barnes, who is the founder, owner, and president of Integrated Resource Management. Mark has a bachelor's degree in environmental science and history. His master of forestry degree is from the University of Washington. He has over 25 years of forest management experience and has received two awards for his work in the Sayusla National Forest. And uh, give them a warm welcome because, as Matt said, they're foresters and they like to be in the forest. They don't usually get up and speak in front of people. So give them a warm welcome. Better? There we go. Leave it to a forester to mess it up right from the start. Well, I'd like to thank the, the City Club for inviting us to talk today. Um, Oregon is home to some of the world's most productive forest lands around. The forests here cover 30.5 million acres, almost half of the state's land base. These forests provide environmental, economic, and social benefits for all the Oregonians. So I'm going to start out here, and I don't know how many people know about who the Oregon Department of Forestry is, but Basically, who we are is, is uh, an agency that serves the Oregon Oregonians by helping keep forests healthy and working. We have three main programs that we're responsible for. The first is we're Oregon's largest fire department. We protect 16, point mil 16 million acres, which is about half of Oregon's forest land in the state. With that, we also manage state-owned forest for the benefit of from timber harvesting and recreation and clean water. Some of the examples of that would be the Tillamook State Forest, the Clatsop State Forest, both of those are up on the north coast, the Elliott State Forest, and um, down here locally, there's some state forest in Lane County that's managed out of our Vanita office. The third, the third program that we do is the private forest program, which is the for implementing the Forest Pla Practices Act on timber harvesting going on in the state of Oregon. Our job at the Department of Forestry, we implement the laws and policies that come to us 
basically from you know the federal government, the state government, and also uh, the Board of Forestry, which is an, a group of seven citizens appointed by the governor. And then they're also, when they're appointed by the governor, they're approved by the state senate. So that board of directors basically gives, gives us direction on what we're doing out there. With the topic of today's um, perspectives on alternative approaches to forest management, I'm gonna talk mainly about our forest practices program and our private forest. So more than a third of Oregon's forests are privately owned and they range from small family woodland owners to the large industrial timber companies. These different landowners emphasize, have different emphasis that they set for the values of their lands. And the diversity of the approaches across those landscapes is essential in achieving a sustainable flow of varied benefits for the Oregonians out there. So a healthy, healthy diverse private forest benefits all Oregonians by providing jobs, clean water, wildlife habitat, and many other aspects. The Forest Practices Act, which is how we uh, you know, regulate what's going on, has been updated about 30 times since 1970, 1971 when it was enacted um, by the legislature. So Oregon law gives the Board of Forestry the primary responsibility to adopt or revise the rules within the Forest Practices Act. Uh, basically, in order for them to do that, they've got various methods that they use to gather information and input. They have three forest practices committees around the state of Oregon. One's in southern Oregon, one's in northwest Oregon, and one's over in eastern Oregon. These committees are made up of a diverse group of, of folks, and they'll make recommendations to the Board of Forestry as to changes or, or uh, new adoption for rules and things like that. The board also has advisory groups that they gather information from as well. And occasionally, the legislature themselves have amended the Forest Practices Act to include spe uh, specific requirements for forest operations. As an example, we have one that they passed where along scenic highways, there's a kind of what we call a scenic buffer. So um, the management of leaving trees along the highway is one of those that the, the legislature has dealt with. The Forest Practices Act regulates timber harvesting, road construction, chemical use, and other practices relating to forest management on private lands. And by law, its focus is protecting the natural resources. Over the last few years, you know, there's been some additions done to that, one of which is public safety when it comes down to high hazard landslide areas from some of the, the uh, storm systems that we've had in the past. The act requires post-harvest reforestation, stream, stream side buffers, and other measures and specific best management practices to protect water, soil, sensitive wildlife sites, and other resources. ODF has field foresters and technical specialists that work with the landowners to help educate them and provide information in the, the legal requirements that the Forest Practices Act requires. And while at the same time our, for, our field foresters are out there dealing with trying to, to help our, our landowners you know, achieve what they want to do for timber harvesting or forest management, we also have, have the responsibility of enforcing that Forest Practices Act if there is a violation. So through some of that, we use written plans where if somebody's operating next to a sensitive resource, it could be a stream or a wetland or um, some kind of wildlife protected area. A written plan's required and those, those field foresters are able to use that as a tool to communicate with the landowners and make sure that we're all on the same page with um, what's gonna happen out there. The act recognizes that lands, environmental conditions, and management activities are different around the state, and it takes that into consideration and has flexibility built into that so that landowners can choose as to what their management style and what their management goals are for their property. So and as, a, as an example, it could be anything from a landowner can choose to thin or they can choose to clear cut. If they're talking about trying to cross a stream, they can choose to put in a permanent long-term bridge, or they could 
um, look at doing some kind of a Ford where they're going going through the the uh, area and coming back out to putting in culverts and things like that. So with that, the department seeks to protect the natural resources primarily on state and private lands. We also work with the federal government agencies. You know, they they have agreed to to meet or exceed the Forest Practices Act on the federal lands. And our goal is to keep the forest healthy, working, and sustainable. And the mission rests with the premise that the healthy and diverse private forest lands provide value for all the Oregonians out there. So with that, I will say thank you, and I'll be here in a little bit for answering more questions. All right. Well, it's uh, very good to be here and talk about forests. Um, you know, forests have a huge impact on our lives here in Oregon, clearly, not only because of the wood products and, and contributions to our economy, <clears throat> but all of these other values that we derive from them, the habitat values, <clears throat> clean air and water, and just that uh, well-being we get from spending time in the forest. Uh, our forests are dynamic and they're resilient. They're not just simply a collection of trees, but really they're a collection of components, a collection of processes that occur over time, spatially distributed across the landscape. Trees are growing and dying, falling over, regenerating. Openings are coming and going in the forest canopy. So really, the forest is comprised of all kinds of processes, all these components, the shrubs, the wildlife, water, soils. So it's clear that they have values that are really difficult to quantify. They have values that go beyond just the wood products and the, and the economic contributions that they, that they provide. Um, at Trout Mountain Forestry, uh, we're a consulting forestry firm and we work with family forest landowners municipal forests and communities who recognize all of these other values and by taking an alternative approach to forest management we're able to uh, help protect and enhance these values in the forest. The landowners we work with are definitely interested in, in the financial benefits that their forests have to offer but it's not the sole objective. Uh, really what we're seeking is a balance uh, by managing for multiple resources. So if we're talking about an alternative approach to forest management, we need to you know, be clear on what a conventional approach is. <clears throat> a conventional approach, what we see broadly across the landscape on private lands in Western Oregon, is really a clear-cut harvest regime. Uh, it's based on uh, even age management, growing a single age class, um, intensive vegetation control, planting of Douglas fir primarily, and then um, rotation ages that seem to be getting pretty short, is, uh, rotation age at which point the, the forest is harvested uh, as young as age 35. So the goal in that approach is really it's to be as economically efficient as possible in growing and harvesting logs. Uh, clear cutting is a primary tool, and as a tool it's extremely effective if operational and economic efficiency is, that, is your goal. Uh, that approach, uh, by design, reduces the variability in the forest and, and reduces uncertainty, reduces risk that, that, you, um, that you would take on in, in growing and harvesting trees. And it's an effort, really, to put that forest under control of the manager. The approach that we generally take uh, on the lands we manage, it, it attempts to balance multiple values, not really an effort to simplify the forest uh, but rather an effort to maintain that complexity and to allow those natural processes that are occurring to play a role in the development of the forest and, and for those processes to contribute to the forest diversity. So why would you want a complex forest, though? Um, well, from that complexity grows all of these other values that we're, we're trying to encourage. And really the complexity adds to resiliency in your forest. We have uh, over 80 clients totaling about 40,000 acres, uh, ranging from the South Willamette Valley, the coast range, up to the north coast and into southwest Washington and the gorge. <clears throat> on these 
uh, on these lands each year, we uh, administer and harvest operations on about a third of those lands. So timber harvesting is a, is a major uh, function uh, on these clients' properties. But I want to outline uh, a few of these clients just to give you a sense of, of, of who we work with. We manage four municipal watersheds right now, including the city of Corvallis. Uh, Corvallis was using a conventional management approach on their forest lands with <clears throat> even age clear cut harvesting up until the late 80s when the spotted owl controversy, uh, concerns over the spotted owl, uh, caused the citizens of Corvallis essentially to, to say, we want no more clear cutting. So there was a moratorium on harvest. And then in 2005, uh, a two year process was initiated where the citizens of Corvallis uh, and the city of Corvallis <clears throat> worked together with us to develop a forest management plan which put uh, drinking water quality and <clears throat> wildlife habitat as primary management objectives. In 2007, we initiated the first harvest on city lands in nearly 20 years. And since then, it's been uh, really uh, quite active in management, both with restoration work and with uh, restoration-focused timber harvests on the property. Another client we work with is the Van Eck Forest Foundation, who owns 7,000 acres in Lincoln County. These lands, which are primarily uh, former industrial forest lands and plantation type conditions, are currently being managed to uh, develop old growth forest structure. So we're taking the simple uh, condition that they're in and adding complexity to these. At the same time, we're, uh, a major goal is to generate income for, that, for the landowner. A conservation easement, which is a deed restriction that protects the conservation values of the property uh, by limiting harvest activities and removing development rights, ensures that these goals uh, are met and are, are put uh, up front in, in the management activities that are occurring on the property. About a third of the lands that we manage are owned by families. Uh, these family forest owners are quite diverse, uh, both in their ownership style and background. Uh, they range from 10 acres to over 1,000 acres in size. Some of these folks have recently acquired forest lands. Others have, have owned their forests for generations and worked with foresters at Trout Mountain for decades, spanning generations. These uh, folks are generally very pragmatic. Uh, they, they expect and, and, uh, and value the economic benefits they get from their forests, uh, but they also see their forests as part of their family heritage. So really a conventional approach is not the right fit for these kinds of landowners. So to me, the question is really not why, why are we doing this or why do we want to take an alternative approach, but how do we achieve it? How do we, how do, we do that? What allows these families or communities um, or these municipalities to take an alternative approach? What allows them to manage for wildlife habitat, drinking water, aesthetics, uh, to really consider community interests or just to, just to manage in a way that respects their emotional c connection to their forest. Well, <laughs> really we're able to do that because in forestry, as foresters, we have a huge toolbox that we can draw from. There's, there are all kinds of treatments that can be applied to these forests. Uh, we have a long time frame in forestry. So as we're choosing how to apply these tools and which tools to use, we, we have to consider the intensity the timing and the scale of how we apply them. Thinning as a tool, for instance, which is traditionally done for removing weak trees to favor the strong ones, can also be used to, to differentiate the spatial arrangement of individual trees in your forest. And what that does is it, it changes the architecture of individual crowns of trees throughout your forest. So these trees can play different roles over the course of, of their life. Individual tree selection is removing individual trees to release those sunshine, uh, water, and growing space resources, which allows growing space for smaller trees. <clears throat> we can use a variety of, of size, of opening sizes across, across the property, from very small group openings where we're taking just a handful of trees to large openings where you're really trying to regenerate 
<clears throat> the stand. Large openings are, um, are necessary and useful and, um, and in, in creating the bigger openings on the landscape, uh, the, the reserving specific areas associated with those openings, keeping certain portions of the stand uncut allows you to develop legacies on the landscape which contribute to the forest diversity and complexity of that site. The use of mixed species plantings, targeted vegetation control, the use of reserves where you're, you're really identifying areas that you're just not going to cut, they're going to persist on the landscape. Extended rotation ages and varying rotation ages across the landscape. All of these are tools and approaches that can be varied and that can be applied in, with different timing, different scale, and different intensities. <clears throat> Harvest technologies are, uh, are present. that We can use these to um, utilize very, very small logs and to really uh, get value when we are harvesting timber. In addition to the treatments we're applying and how we're doing it, we also can utilize those processes that are occurring naturally in the forest. We can, um, we can allow them to occur, especially if we're managing for wildlife habitat and diverse conditions. Mortality uh, pro provides lying dead trees uh, and standing dead trees, which contribute a lot of habitat value. Natural regeneration, canopy gaps come and go, shrub development, all of these things that are occurring throughout our forest, uh, rather than <clears throat> trying to control those or work around those or avoid them on the landscape, we can en encourage those in a way that, um, that allow that diversity to play a role in the forest. So how we're using these tools, it's really not formulaic. Uh, it's not just simply a case of adding and subtracting variables until we get to this outcome or output, but really it's based on detailed local knowledge of a site, knowing what those site-specific conditions are, and then making informed man management decisions that are tailored to fit the specific conditions and objectives. The financial considerations are obviously uh, part of this, so so the how of the finances and economics of it, you know, we're going from this model, an intensive model of putting uh, a focused inputs in, into the forest with expectation of focused outputs to really a broad range of inputs where we're getting a broad range of outputs, but we're only monetizing a subset of these values that we're getting off of these forests. So how does it work financially? You know, there, there are funding mechanisms that can, uh, and conservation uh, funding that can support um, certain activities on your forest. Conservation easements that I mentioned can be sold. You can sell those rights. Uh, forest carbon can be sold if you're sequestering additional carbon. These are definitely not for everyone. Uh, those tools are extremely complex, uh, but we have used both of those on our client lands to generate income for landowners, both for acquisition and as a, as a revenue source. If restoration and habitat values are high on your list, there are grant funding sources and partnerships you can enter into. <clears throat> But really, you know, it's the log values that, that you're, where most of your value comes from. So, uh, you know, as you, as you are growing and managing a diverse forest, you have a diverse set of products that are coming off of that, and you can tap into lots of markets, niche markets, and really utilize those values. Any good forest manager is really trying to uh, have good utilization and maximize the utilization and value of the products coming off of their forest, especially the logs. But the real key to the financial, um, uh, the financial how is, is having modest for, uh, financial expectations. Um, it's, this is not to say there are no expectations coming off your forest, but a lot of the landowners we work with uh, have had a long tenure of ownership. They're patient, and so they have more modest financial expectations, and it just takes some of the pressure off the performance of the forest. So as we think about how we are managing and want to manage our forests in Oregon, it's important to consider what our expectations are. How much can we remove from these forests and how much are we willing to leave behind? How much pressure can we really put on our forests to perform whatever the resources we're, we're drawing from them? A conventional for, approach to forest management is meeting 
uh, our demands for wood products. It's providing economic and financial benefits, but it's really using a small set of tools to achieve that. But there is more than one way to manage a forest, and by digging deeper into our toolbox and seeking a balanced approach to forest management, we see that those economic and ecological values that the forests provide us don't have to be exclusive of each other. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Matt. That was a good segue into what I'm going to talk about today. Matt covered the details, uh, a lot of the tools that uh, foresters can use. And what I wanted to talk today about was um, giving an example of a good, basically I'm going to provide a good example of how some of the things Matt talked about are being done on the landscape at the landscape level. So. Um, the story I'm going to tell is the story of what's happened on the Sisla National Forest in about the last 15 years. And it's a story about um, how the forest transitioned from an original paradigm of liquidating old growth timber to a new paradigm of restoring the landscape using thinning. So a little bit real quick about what I am and what I do. So I own integrated resource management. And like Matt, I'm a consulting forester. I have a small staff of employees, and we manage forest lands, um, like Matt, um, from landowners from five acres to 2,000 acres. We also do quite a bit of traditional forestry work related to the valuation of timber. People hire us to tell them what their timber is worth. And we also do quite a bit of restoration work for public agencies and land trusts. Uh, do quite a bit of work for Portland Metro and for the Nature Conservancy and the City of Eugene Parks. Um, so we're sort of a two-part company in terms of traditional forestry but also restoration services and uh, I've been doing this for 25 years now or I've, uh, the business has been around for 22 years and um, I started the business because I was pretty frustrated with what I was doing before when I was working for a large publicly traded corporation managing timberland and uh, I want to do something more interesting. So um, that's sort of my background. I'm a Californian, you know, I moved here, didn't go home. <laughs> um, and so um, this story I'm going to tell is a, basically a, a good model for other national forests. It's a good model for other public agencies uh, and public ownerships and it's probably a good model also for both private and uh, both public and private ownerships that want to do silvicultural silviculture differently and to manage the land differently. So uh, let's talk about the Sayuslaw Law National Forest. I guess you all probably know where it is. It's out there in the coast range, a little over a million acres, pretty small forest. It's in Lincoln County mostly and, and down farther south into Coos. Um, and the Sayuslaw Law was um, one of the earlier forests established by the Forest Service and its history its early history was really all about uh, sort of opening up the landscape and the wilderness to settlers and helping them. And so roads were established, small mills uh, were established, and the Forest Service uh, basically some more supported small logging by uh, offering small timber sales early on in its, in its history. Um, later during the World War II, uh, the harvesting on the forest increased mainly to feed spruce into uh, aviation, which uh, they were building gliders and airplanes out of spruce in those days. Um, and then sort of during the 40s through the 90s, uh, they sort of took the model they were using from the war and escalated it into a full-on whole-scale harvesting. And the whole goal was to basically harvest the old forests and create young thrifty plantations, uh, which would then feed the wood products industry forever. Um, and so to give you a little bit of idea uh, how much they actually harvested, um, so during the 1980s, which was pretty the big year of harvest on the Sayuslaw National Forest, they were harvesting uh, anywhere from 250 million to 400 million board feet of timber every year. So to give you an idea, there's about 4,000 board feet of timber on a log truck. So we're talking about upwards of 100,000 log trucks a year were being harvested off the National Forest. So, and, and it sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. <laughs> and, 
And it's pretty amazing what they did to landscape in a very short period of time. Essentially, like 60% of the landscape was turned into plantations. The Sayuslaw Law National Forest back in the heydays had, uh, as I remember, over 20 people responsible for just administering each individual timber cell. So they'd have 20 timber cells going at one time. But at the same time, it was only 50 to 75 percent of the growth of the forest. So you need to also remember that the Sisla National Forest is the best growing ground in the world. It can grow trees better than anywhere else in the world, pretty much. And so it's amazing that they were only harvesting, even at those levels, 50 percent, which was of what was actually growing. Um, 1990, as you all might know, the spotted owl was listed as endangered and basically stopped the harvesting of timber on the National Forest. And, um, the next year, uh, the harvest went down to less than 5 million board feet annually. So essentially a 99% reduction in the harvesting. Um, so a lot of social uh, impacts, people, mills closed, people were, you know, left without work, uh, a huge transition for everyone. And um, finally in 94, the Northwest Forest Plan was adopted. And the goal of the Northwest Forest Plan was to uh, restore the National Forest. Uh, and so um, at the time, the Sayuslaw Law also went through their own plan revision. Um, and so uh, what ended up was essentially of the Sayuslaw Law National Forest, 90% of the forest, over 90% of the forest ended up in what was designated as late successional reserve or riparian reserve. And so under the Northwest Forest Plan, late successional reserve is where the only thing you can do is re restorative. The whole goal is to restore the landscape. So these late successional reserves were not all old growth. They were these huge landscapes that included patches of old growth and patches of forest that had been regenerated plantations. And then the rest of it was uh, in riparian reserves. And only, I think, 6 or 7%, as I recall from the plan, was uh, in what's called matrix. Matrix is where you get to go out and do traditional forestry, you know, even age forestry. Um, so the forest was basically served up this option where, you know, you can't do anything except work in those late successional reserves. So a good thing happened. Uh, the forest uh, started working um, on their planning and working on the um, watershed analysis and they had some innovative leaders at the forest and they decided that they would start thinning these young plantations to create old growth, to push these young stands faster so they would emulate an old growth forest quicker. So um, they began on a thinning regime in the late um, first part of the de first decade uh, and then um, they realized at the time and the leadership realized at the time that the true way to move forward, and the only way to move forward uh, without a lot of conflict was by enacting uh, uh, collaboration, basically working with the stakeholders, working with the environmental groups, working with the people that live in the landscape to come up with solutions on the landscape to how to restore the landscape. So um, they, um, they, the leadership really realized that there's um, as much value in the outside perspectives of the stakeholders as was coming from internally within their staff. And they realized that if they were going to succeed and they were going to restore this landscape, the lands those young plantations would need to be thin, because if they weren't thin, they'd pretty much just slow down in growth and stagnate for a long, long period of time until something happened, some natural occurrence happened. Uh, so the Forest Service basically embarked on this um, this effort to thin these plantations. Um, the, these plantations we're talking about are what Matt spoke about earlier, you know, young, intensively managed plantations. These are stands that were clear cut. The, the old growth was clear cut. They were burned. They were sprayed. They were planted. They were sprayed. They were pre-commercially thinned. They were usually planted as monocultures, essentially just Douglas fir. And, uh, if you go to these young plantations today, you'll be walking through a monoculture of young Douglas fir. So th that is essentially what the landscape looked like uh, in these plantations. Uh, and what the forests embarked on was doing restoration thinning, essentially doing uh, what's called variable density thinning, 
where you thin the forest, but you don't thin it evenly. You thin across all the diameter ranges, and you try to create d diversity. Diversity in terms of the species, and diversity in terms of the structure, and diversity in terms of the composition. So trying to thin more like Mother Nature would thin naturally through small natural disturbances. So um, they, uh, some of these techniques that are used, they also uh, involve retaining legacy trees, so any older trees that were in the stands, creating small openings about the size of this room uh, to uh, allow for a new cohort or a new generation of young trees to grow, and those areas would be planted. Uh, and then also they uh, rely upon uh, creating snags, basically going in these pl plantations and creating guys go up, top these trees, fall these tops on the ground, and that creates downwood and uh, snags. So that's um, what the site law now has been doing for about 10 years, and what they've also been doing, um, and, and the methodology they've been using, the contracting tool they've been using is called stewardship contracting. And this was a new, a new concept that came out uh, in basically just around 2010, um, or right around 2000 actually, which was um, the concept of allowing people to go thin the forest for restorative purposes, but at the same time uh, trading goods for services. So essentially having contracts where the purchaser would buy the timber, would log the timber, but instead of necessarily all the money coming to the Forest Service and going to Treasury, the money essentially, some of the work, res restorative work on the forest would be done by that contractor and some of the money would stay on the forest to do other restoration. So the key components of, um, of stewardship contracting that came around 13 years ago now are um, uh, the ability to use goods for services, uh, the ability to have multi-year contracts, that's really important so that the contracts can be longer period. Um, emphasis on local uh, labor force, that's an important part of stewardship contracting. Um, and also uh, the ability to retain the money on the forest and then to issue contracts to do restoration on the forest and also do restoration on adjacent lands, on private lands, uh, through what's called the Wyden Authority. Uh, which was back in 1998, um, Senator Wyden passed an amendment which allows the federal forest, federal money to be spent on private land adjacent to federal forest if it benefits the federal forest. So on the Sayusla National Forest and in those watersheds, um, about half the money that the forest generates through the sale of the timber as part of those stewardship thinning sales is spent on private lands to restore salmon habitat, to restore the forest, to do thinnings, to do snag creation, riparian restoration. And then about the other half of the money is spent on the forest to do the same type of work but on the Forest Service land. So it's been very successful. Um, so some of, the, some of the results and successes have been, uh, so just for a four-year period from 2008 to 2014, these were the um, uh, the average sale volume was about 40 million board feet, so about a, you know, an eighth of what it had been historically. Um, earned income was about $114 million, so these are the socioeconomic impacts, and uh, that was about 640 full-time jobs are being created through the thinning program and all the restoration associated with it. Um, average wage was about $24 an hour, so it's pretty good wages on average. Um, and the state received about almost $3 million in taxes through the, through, uh, the sale of the timber and the other services. Uh, in terms of biophysical accomplishments, what, what's happened over that, just that four-year period, this program's been going on for 13 years, uh, they did 23 large fish passage culvert replacements or removals. So 23 really big culverts that were blocking salmon habitat were replaced or removed. Over 75 miles of road were decommissioned, obliterated, got rid of. Uh, about 500 logs were placed in streams to restore fish habitat. And um, another 500 acres of wildlife habitat were restored. And over 6,000 snags were created. 
And this is just a tiny list of what was created. The list goes on and on. Uh, it's a very extensive list of the other res restoration that's been done on or near the forest. It's all been part of this uh, thinning program that has come under stewardship contracting. Um, and then another success is um, that there have been no appeal, appeals nor litigation on the Sisla National Forest in 20 years. So there hasn't been a timber sale that's been appealed administratively or litigated. Uh, so it's true collaboration. There's a lot of uh, players that are involved that um, make it happen. Um, so, uh, and then probably the most important thing about what the accomplishment was, was it's restoring the landscape. You know, we're taking these young plantations which were not very functional uh, from an ecosystem standpoint, and we're thinning them, and they're creating a better forest for the long term. Uh, and there's lots of other associated ecosystem services out there on the forest that are being benefited, such as clean water, such as salmon, and you know, those are non-monetized resources, but they're probably the most significant impact of what they're doing on the Sites Law National Forest. So, uh, why has it been success? You know, other places around the Pacific Northwest and in the interior west, they've tried to do this type of thing. They've tried to restore the forest, and often it's ended up in controversy. And other national forests, even close by to the Sice Law, have had the same problems. And I think um, it, it boils down to a few things. Uh, I, I've been a member of the uh, Sayus Law Stewardship Group now for about 10 years, so I'm a participant on the Sayus Law Stewardship Group, so I meet every month as part of the collaborative. Um, and that, that group essentially as assists the forest in identifying issues, helps the forest uh, early on in terms of the scoping of the projects, what they plan on doing, how they're going to do it, where they're going to do it, why they're going to do it. Um, and the group also oversees the distribution of the funds for uh, the restoration on the private lands that are generated from the timber sales. And I've been part of that for uh, about almost 10 years now. And um, I, I'd, I think one of the most important reasons that it's been successful on the Sias Law and less so elsewhere is just really good leadership. And that's probably the most important thing, uh, the leadership at the forest and the leadership within the stakeholders and the leadership within um, uh, the rest of the, the collaborative. Um, and so there's a lot of forests out there that have uh, tried this but haven't been successful. And, and the leadership on the site slot dates back to the early 1990s when we had a, um, a uh, forest supervisor by the name of Jim Furnish who, who came and started the forest on this course and he was a really good leader and ever since then the site law has had great forest supervisors who are the leaders and they know that basically the forest does things differently and they take risks and they work with the collaboratives and they uh, they they basically endorse the whole concept of different ideas they realize they don't have all the answers um, so that's probably one of the most important things and then the stakeholders uh, willingness to cooperate and work towards a greater goal you know the our collaboratives we all have environmental organizations that sit on the collaborative along with folks from the community and watershed councils and foresters and loggers uh, but everybody is resolved to say hey we need a way forward and we, we are going to work towards the ultimate goal of restoring the landscape and there's a real commitment and that's leadership from all those organizations um, and the other important thing I think is that it's based on ecosystem uh, restoration and not just strictly extraction. And that's why it works for the public in general. Um, so uh, that pretty much wraps it up. I, I'd like to mention that we couldn't do any of that. They can't do any of that work on the Sayusla National Forest without partnerships also with the industry. And the industry buys all that wood. And all those mills like Georgia Pacific and Philomath, about 20% of their wood comes from these sales. And without those mills, restoration on the landscape won't occur. And that's been a problem in Eastern Oregon and Eastern Washington where they're trying to do the same thing, but they have no place to take the wood and therefore the wood has no value. If the wood has no value, then there's no money to do the restoration that needs to be done on the landscape. So uh, the timber industry is an important partner, even on the Sisla National Forest, even though the timber industry doesn't necessarily manage their lands in a similar fashion. 
And um, that's it. Uh, if you'd like to hear about Jim Furnish, he's talking um, on the 14th at the University of Oregon Law School from 7 to 8.30. It's a little evening with Jim Furnish put on by Oregon Wild. And if you haven't heard his story and met him, it's a great opportunity to do that. And by the way, I have a banner over here if anybody's interested talking about the site's last story, so you can take a look at that later on. I'm Robin Fletcher, and I'm wondering, our table was wondering, get, this is a long game, you said. What are, how are you adjusting your toolboxes for climate change and drought and Is it on? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, not really sure how we're going to do that. I think the type of silviculture that Matt and I practice is probably very appropriate for uh, adjusting for climate change because we're working with the natural system. We're leaving lots of diversity in the forest, different species. Uh, we don't just manage for one thing. And, uh, you know, traditional intensive silviculture, clear cut, short rotation. Uh, might end up with big problems. Uh, they've already had huge problems in that type of civil culture out on the coast, all the way from Brookings up to the Olympic Peninsula with a, uh, a disease called Swiss needle cast, which, in, which invades the plantations. Uh, so that's already become a big problem. So I think, you know, as part of the civil culture I do, and I, I don't know if I can speak for you, Matt, uh, w we try to create a lot of diversity in the forest, which creates resilience. I would, I would say also on the state side, you know, we've got, like I talked about earlier, the, uh, the Board of Forestry has got the different forest practices committees and things like that. They're always looking at the research that's going on and trying to adapt and use the best available scientific information to, and talking with the advisory groups as to how the Forest Practices Act needs to grow and, and change as, as time comes on, like we talked about earlier. There were... Since, since its inception in 1971, um, there's been 30 rule changes that have occurred. So it'll continue to, to grow, and it's more like a living document. Karen Seidel, City Club member. We've heard about the <clears throat> remarkable efforts on the Sayus Law to <clears throat> promote restoration. Is anything comparable going on in the other national forests, like the Willamette and Mount Hood? Um, there's actually a, quite a few collaboratives on the west side uh, and also on the east side. The site law has probably been the most successful uh, overall. Um, there's one going on on the McKenzie Ranger District. There's a brand new one going uh, up in Oak Ridge uh, on the Willamette National Forest. There's, uh, there's some down on the Umpqua. Uh, the Mount Hood has a very successful collaborative and the uh, Gifford Pinchot as well. So, so they're everywhere. Uh, most, most forests have uh, a collaborative program going where the forest is working with uh, stakeholders. Um, the Sayusla has been most successful in terms of um, both the collaborative effort and also in terms of the forest really committing to doing actions on the landscape. Uh, and then the other benefit is that the west side forests have over the east side collaboratives is that uh, it's a resilient forest and a lot that has to be done out there involves thinning the forest and the trees are worth a lot more and there's a lot more milk capacity. So that helps to basically create the money to do the restoration work. Susan Conley, City Club member, thank you all so much for coming. Since the Oregon uh, Forest Practices Act is widely regarded as just about the worst as far as environmental protecting anything in our forests, there is a bill now before the legislature, and Chris Edwards is we're trying to get a committee hearing for him. And this would restrict the chemicals that the forests dump currently in our tributaries, our homes, our schools, our families. What's your position on that? I'll let one of you gentlemen take that. <laughs> yeah, anything? Uh, what, what I would say right now is our agency, we, you know, there are several bills that are out there in the legislature. Our agency is participating. There's some different advisory groups that the, the uh, legislative folks have put together. And so 
there's our agency along with several of the other agencies and just different groups that are providing information to those um, those those folks. Um, basically, you know, it's it's going to be for us. We implement the the rules, the laws that have been passed, and so we're we're waiting to see what uh, what comes out of the legislature, and then from there the agency will develop the the process to move forward with whatever whatever implementation needs to occur. Jerry Smith, City Club member. It, it appears to me, while you're talking about agencies with good policy, that the political power is in the hands of the international corporations, Georgia Pacific, um, Weyerhaeuser, and maybe even the Koch brothers, as I understand, are heavily involved in our state politics now. Do you think that's where most of the timber policy is going to come from? <laughs> you know, I, I don't. I don't even know how how I would answer that one, except for to say, really, you know, our agency, the the forest practices rules are developed by the Board of Forestry. It's made up of, of folks that are appointed by the governor and, and approved by the state senate. Um, and then, you know, anybody in the state of Oregon has the opportunity to talk to their local legislative representatives and be able to, to request a bill or talk to them about sponsoring a bill, that kind of thing. And so really, you know, what we end up doing as an agency is what the, the rules or laws are that are passed or what we implement, and uh, we don't have a lot of opportunity or we don't take that opportunity to, to be able to direct any of that. That's, we're a neutral, neutral agency that, that basically enforces those rules. I, I could add something here, if you don't mind. Just, I think everybody should remember that, you know, the industry isn't really like monolithic. So, I mean, you have all sorts of different landowners and players and family-run timber companies and publicly traded timber companies, and they don't necessarily all see eye to eye, and they manage their timber and their forest lands differently. So, you know, some of the, the good examples of family-run ownerships that manage differently are the Starkers or the Port Blakeleys or the Senecas, where they manage longer rotation, a lot more diversity. Gustina is another one. Uh, the big industrial publicly traded corporations are more under the short rotation even age. And then we have landowners that, that Matt and I manage that do things very progressively. So it's not really monolith monolithic at all. So I think, and I, and I think the Board of Forestry, because it requires members from all different parts of the industry, small, large environmental groups, is probably going to do a pretty good job. And also, just so everybody knows, there's, I think, less than 10 states in the union that actually have a forest practices law. There's quite a few that have, quote, best management practices, which means nothing. You can do whatever you want. Um, so Oregon is actually pretty far ahead of the game. Like all those states in the southeast, there's no force practices laws whatsoever. You can do whatever you want. Hi, I'm James Baldock, City Club member since 2012. My group was wondering, especially to you two, um, what you thought of, like you have a very interesting way of harvesting forests. My understanding is that uh, the OLC, ONC DeFazio plan kind of just sets half aside and half is kind of do whatever you want. I wanted to get your opinion on whether that's a, the best way to, you know, preserve our forests and create economic value, an all right way or a terrible way to do that. Well, I guess I would say maybe I would categorize that as all right, um, but it you know, to me, what it doesn't do is illustrate that you can achieve more than one objective off of, uh, off of the same acres. You know, it kind of, it really differentiates one approach versus another as opposed to integrating, uh, you know, taking a more comprehensive management. So, um, you know, it, it, it will probably achieve some of the goals, and, um, but, it, but it really ends up in this kind of divisive approach where you're not you're not meeting multiple objectives across the landscape, but rather at uh, specific scales. So. Uh, Ruth Daimler. Um, I wasn't too surprised, but uh, you didn't mention climate change, and that's been brought up before. You wouldn't be cutting another tree if you had really the deep concern that many of us have about saving our forests because of climate change. We needed to sequester 
the carbon. We need it to protect our civilization. And, um, but to add to that, um, it seems like uh, we don't have the rules that really protect our community in so many ways. I'd like to know how much any of you are involved with biomass that is a very dirty and very inefficient and very carbon producing fuel. Thank you. Uh, I'm not involved in biomass at all. On the west side we have um, chip log markets so we can sell that small material into, uh, into to create pulp for paper. Um, yeah, we, uh, we, we have not been involved with biomass extraction on the west side either for the same purposes as uh, Matt says. You know, the vast majority of all the wood ends up utilized either for lumber or for paper. So biomass is a very small uh, part of it. Uh, one benefit of the harvesting of bi biomass is, is that most of that biomass is going to get burned anyhow. It's going to get burned on the landings. It's going to get blown into the atmospheres. So why not use that biomass to generate power? Uh, and on the east side, there's been some successful stories in regard to that. So I, I don't think biomass is a dirty word at all. Uh, I mean, every energy has its costs, even solar. As for the, you know, the state, um, ODF has actually got one biomass forester that travels around the state working with, with individuals and trying to help, you know, look at that, uh, that program and see what can be developed about it. And so like what Mark was talking about, a lot of focus has gone on the east side where there's some of those opportunities to, uh, to start up some small little um, organizations or companies working on that. And they've actually done some where they've put some, uh, some biomass utilization into some of the schools and stuff like that for heating the, heating the schools and things. So, you know, there's, there's some of that that's going on out there and our agency's working with like uh, Department of Energy and things like that as well. Kathy King, City Club. Um, is there any plan to implement Paul Stamets' recommendation? He authored Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Help Save the World. His recommendation is that we seed mycelium in the forest clear cuts, then they attract the, um, uh, they grow and they attract the uh, insects. Then the insects attract the birds, and the birds poop, and they uh, distribute the diff diversity of the forest. And I'm, I'm hoping we're getting it away from clear cuts because uh, I've been a rural pro property seller for 29 years, a realtor, and I've seen the effects of clear cuts next to stands of trees. The stands of trees blow down up in Blue River. So I think we need to take care of our clear cuts. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that, uh, the mushroom saving the world, but uh, we, that's not something that we're currently using. Yeah, I guess I'm not familiar with it either. I mean, the way we do forestry, we try to encourage the natural systems. And uh, I, I'd also like to say that I, I personally, even though this type of forestry I do, I generally don't clear cut. I have clear cut, and a clear cut is okay in and of itself. It's just simply another civil cultural tool. How you use it on the landscape and to what degree you use it on the landscape is what you need to think about. So. All clear cutting isn't necessarily right. All thinning isn't necessarily right. It's how you use that tool.